of lectures, uh, each with another focus, so one on internal borders and the other on external borders, crossing federal borders, ancient and modern. Both series were initiated by the inaugural lecture delivered by Hans back on March 7th. Today, we inaugurate a webinar series crossing federal borders, ancient and modern, which will run for three years, like the other one, and aims to analyze dynamics that are precisely cross-border. That is uh, specifically phenomena such as cross-border cooperation networks of whatever nature, as well as categories of individuals, the so-called Grenzgänger, who cross uh, border very often, cross-border. This is the key concept uh, today. The studies on contemporary federalism carried out in particular at the Institute for Comparative Federalism in Bolzano insist a great deal on cross-border. And it was reading uh, this bibliography years ago when I began to explore the problem of border management in Greek antiquity by ancient Greek koina, that is federal states. It was at this point that I began to wonder about the role that uh, these cross-border activities might also have played uh, in uh, stabilizing uh, border areas. I believe that this role has also been reflected upon by the students and uh, PhD students reading the article suggested by our speaker today. And now I will limit myself to pointing out just a few issues uh, that open up new perspective for classicists as well, while keeping in mind uh, that uh, what is comparable and what is not comparable. Um, it seems to me more effective now to formulate these issues in terms of uh, questions. So to what extent is intrafederal and cross-border cohesion significant? How can people living in bordering territories be brought closer together? What is cross-border territoriality and what factors are responsible for its emergence? How can cross-border cooperation be facilitated are previous interactions relevant? Is cross-border cooperation in discontinuous territories possible? Is it limited to being mere networking or can it also be a new cross-border territoriality resembling an integrated space? What is cross-borderization? and reactivation and functionalization of previous informal cross-border activities. How can cultural diversity be approached? Is convergence in terms of economic development level an obvious effect of cross-border cooperation? Does ethno-linguistic diversity hamper cross-border cooperation what happens when a linguistic group is cross-border or is divided by a political border? Does it make sense to distinguish between a top-down institutional-driven cross-border integration and a bottom-up cross-border inter integration? We look forward to hearing from our guest, Professor Francesco Palermo, who needs no introduction, of course, but I'll just say a few words for the younger students. Francesco Palermo is Professor for Comparative Constitutional Law and Director of the Institute for Comparative Federalism of Bozen. He's President of the International Association of Centers for Federal Studies, Constitutional Advisor to the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe, member and vice president of the scientific committee of the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, and previously president of the advisory committee under the Council of Europe's Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities and a non-party member of the Italian Senate. I am delighted today to give him the floor to talk about the laws and function of cross-border cooperation. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Elena, for this kind invitation. Thank you all for taking the time and, and the patience to listen to a weird animal, uh, especially from your perspective, uh, dealing with uh, a subject that I hope uh, presents some um, interesting hints also with regard to your field of studies. Um, I, I am supposed to speak from a different perspective. So thank you for also making me the guinea pig of, uh, of this sort of new type of uh, cross-cultural seminars. Uh, and also thank you for presenting such a long list of questions that I was not aware of before starting the seminar. So I have prepared something which is not necessarily uh, overlapping with these questions, but I will I will try to give some answer, at least from this perspective, to the uh, actually very topical questions that you have formulated. Um, all right. Now, it should be visible also from uh, yeah, remote. Um, uh, okay. okay. And you will also forgive my, as I was saying, boomer uh, uh, images that I have just downloaded from the web. And sometimes, especially if you project them on the big screen, you see that the quality is not exceptional, but um, it's more um, about the substance of what we're going to say uh, rather than the quality of the images. Now, um, I will try to take you uh, through a short history of uh, the cross-border cooperation from a legal point of view, um, which is, as a matter of fact, a you can say a recent phenomenon. Uh, if you take the law of nation states as we have known them for the past couple of centuries. But indeed, as your research also testifies, the phenomenon is not new at all. So it is rather an, an exception uh, to the exception. Uh, so it is an exception to the law of states, which very much stick on border and are based uh, is based on territoriality. But this law of states, very much limited by borders, is an exception in history. So um, again, what is the rule and what is the exception might very much depend on you know, a closer or a broader perspective of the history of such phenomena. Borders are not necessarily natural. There are natural borders, of course, and natural borders um, have shaped the history of law to also quite some significant degree. Think of the Swiss cantons. The Swiss cantons were basically valleys. And uh, back in time when it was extremely cumbersome to cross from one valley to the other, it was kind of natural to develop um, a sort of strong autonomy in the valley for the people of the valley for the simple reason that there were very little contacts with people of other valleys. But then, you know, when some um, function starts to connect people for whatever reason, normally for economic or military reasons, then forms of cooperation naturally develop. Um, in the world regulated by law, which is the world we are currently living in, then of course you have to construct the rules and the mechanics of this sort of cooperation. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. Uh, and what is easy and what is difficult uh, does not normally follow a logic of what seems to be kind of you know natural and what uh, in, instead uh, might seem more complicated than it really is in practice. But we will see some of these points uh, later on. Now, um, my task tonight is to try to provide you with some basic information on the development of the law of cross-border cooperation in present times. So uh, in, the, in the time when it moves from the exception to the exception, as I was trying to explain before, uh, and becoming a sort of a new normal, 
uh, new normal is not only post-pandemic world, but it's also uh, the, the world where the borders do exist, but also are there to be crossed and not necessarily to establish barriers, to, to become filters rather than only barriers. Um, let me start also with some um, quote that goes back in history, not as far as you go, but still a little bit uh, behind the, uh, the contemporary times, which is uh, um, a statement or a sentence by uh, Niccolò Machiavelli, um, who used to say, and this applies perfectly also to the law of cross-border cooperation, that there is nothing more difficult to execute nor more dubious of success, nor more dangerous to administer than to introduce a new order of things. What is the new order of things? The new order of things is borders that are not necessarily borders or borders that connect rather than separate. Um, take the world after, and Europe in particular. Um, I will say also something about non-Europe. I don't know to what extent uh, non-European experiences are interesting to you, uh, but just to make clear from the outset, cross-border cooperation, or better said, legal cross-border cooperation is predominantly, if not exclusively, a European phenomenon. Uh, you find ways of cross-border cooperation also in non-European settings, of course, but there is hardly any regulation on how that needs to be administered. So it works kind of in practice, more or less, rather less. Whereas in Europe, uh, it has become a, a, an extremely sophisticated field of law. So it's also quite interesting also from the cultural uh, or, or even anthropological point of view, why Europe is so obsessed with that and other regions of, of the world are much less. Um, okay. Yes, take uh, Europe uh, of post World War II, where not only borders were set up, but through walls, right? The borders were extremely visible. There was some wire everywhere, where real walls. Uh, the states were the masters of international law. And only what states were allowing was possible and everything else was prohibited. Plus uh, the states were extremely jealous of their prerogatives, not least because their prerogatives were linked with profound constitutional values that were enshrined in the constitutions after the tragedy of World War II. So um, cooperating with other countries was suspicious from the outset because you can cooperate only with countries that share the same fundamental values that you have. So suspicion was kind of the, the key word of uh, the new Europe, especially uh, of post-World War II. Um, at the same time, Europe, as opposed to other continents, is extremely interlinked historically, geographically, culturally, what have you. So there were, from the very beginning, uh, many experiences of trying to overcome this rigid rule, trying to uh, establish some exception to the rule of exclusivist state approach. Um, but these were non-systematic um, solutions to very common problems. Yeah, uh, obviously there was a, the, the Iron Curtain between East and West, uh, which is by now the area where most of the experiences of cross-border cooperation take place that have been, of course, banned from every sort of cooperation uh, where armed uh, armed people uh, patrolling the, the walls and the borders. So no cross-border cooperation activity whatsoever, except for people that were trying to fly, fl uh, flee from, uh, from the communist regimes. Um, but, you know, some timid and very, you know, uh, hidden approaches to cross-border cooperation in other areas of Europe. 
going hand in hand with the development of what is called European integration, whatever it means. So kind of lifting the suspicion vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, those who are on the other side of the board. Yeah. So uh, this idea of rule and exception needs to be kept in mind because that explains uh, lo a lot of what has happened. All right. Um, let me finish the conceptual introductory part by, um, okay, well, this is the structure of the, uh, of the presentation, by starting with some uh, elements of terminology. I realized when Elena and Claudia right, uh, presented, uh, gave a presentation of the project, this fascinating project in, in uh, Bolzano at UREC, uh, that terminology on these issues is pretty much a, a, a very delicate subject, also with regard to uh, the cross-border cooperation in ancient times. Uh, but this does not differ very much from present time. Uh, we find very many uh, different terminology to describe similar activities. So what I try to present you here is a sort of a um, yeah anthology of the terminology that you find. Um, and to make you aware of the fact that you might encounter different terminology meaning the same thing. Um, one of the main reasons for having a different terminology, to be frank, is the institutional jealousy between different uh, international organizations. So uh, as the cross-border cooperation at uh, um, international level has developed predominantly within the framework of the Council of Europe, then the European Union, when it started also to seize some of these areas, uh, needed to establish a different terminology, essentially to differentiate uh, between the EU terminology and the Council of Europe terminology. But the Council of Europe um, speaks normally of transfrontier cooperation. And also the um, main Council of Europe document, which is a framework convention from the year 1980, and I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, is labeled transfrontier cooperation. Uh, basically, the idea is to get rid of the term border, which is considered to be scars of history and uh, all the things that you, you know. So uh, frontier is considered to be a little bit more neutral. Um, and in general, in the terminology, there is the attempt to find as neutral terms as possible, because terminology often is loaded with political significance. And if you use the, the wrong term, um, it might start a political spillover that hampers the whole attempt. Uh, I don't know whether that was the case also in, uh, in ancient times, but certainly nowadays, uh, a, a term might you know, poison uh, the whole discussion. Um, Within the term transfrontier cooperation, you find um, sub concepts uh, divided into transnational cooperation, uh, meaning a cooperation among um, authorities, be it state authorities, regional authorities, local authorities, or municipalities belonging to different countries and interregional or interterritorial cooperation, which is the cooperation between, let's say, regions that do not necessarily share a common border. So, um, and sometimes um, it's also a matter of interpretation whether territories do share or not a common border, paradoxically. Does the province of Trento share a common border with Austria? Well, depends. Uh, if you only take the, the province of Trento, it doesn't. Uh, if you take the region, it does. If you take the state where this territory belongs, then of course it does. So it, it's it's a matter of finding neutral neutral ter uh, terminology. Uh, so it would be an interterritorial cooperation, for example, the Euro region that, uh, the Euro region that is established uh, in this area. The European Union, uh, jumped in later on, as we will see in a moment, um, and tried to not only 
differentiate its terminology from that of the Council of Europe, but also to make it even more neutral. Um, and uh, the choice was for territorial cooperation. So it's no mention of frontiers, no mention of borders, no mention of whatever can be um, delicate from the point of view of, of historical legacies, but it's just territories that neutrally decide to cooperate uh, with one another. And then you find all sort of sub-terminology, inter-territorial, trans-frontier, trans-European, trans-European networks, for example, uh, transnational cooperation and, uh, and, and similar terms. But for the time being, just be aware of the fact that the Council of Europe tends to use transfrontier and the European Union tends to use territorial cooperation. Uh, what is meant, um, a cooperation uh, which includes subnational authorities as well. So it's it's not only interstate cooperation. This is another thing, another phenomenon. This is international relations, basically. Um, of of course, these subnational authorities must belong to different countries, and they need to uh, enjoy a certain degree of autonomy, being territorial autonomy, regional, subregional, or uh, local autonomy. And of course, also have, and this is less legal, uh, they need to have a certain degree of cooperative attitude. Um, so there must be the need to, or, or the, the willingness to do something together. Although it is not rare to have some forms of cooperation um, that do not really want to enhance the cooperation, but just to set a sign, a symbol. Um, especially in the early days of territorial cooperation, there were um, attempts to you know, um, set up some form of symbolic rather than practical cooperation. Just let me make a couple of examples. Um, one example being the um, willingness to show cultural affinity. The first, the very first uh, international treaty that the Belgian, Belgian um, community of the Flanders um, set up when the this Belgian state was transformed uh, also formally in uh, a federal state was a cultural treaty with the Netherlands uh, saying that Flemish Flemish does not exist. Flemish language is Dutch. So um, again, what is the, the practical or the normative purpose of that? Nothing. It's just to make a clear symbolic point. Um, or forms of cooperation um, very informal among regions that shared um, political affinity. Um, there used to be, I mean, you are mostly too young for that, um, including you, Elena, so you probably don't remember, but there was um, an interesting experiment back in the 90s uh, called the Four Motors for Europe. And there were four regions uh, that the only thing in common uh, they, they had the only thing in common of being ruled by Christian Democrats. So it was a Christian Democratic political project. It was the Lombardy when, when it was Christian Democratic. Um, it was um, uh, Bavaria. It was Baden-Württemberg and it was Catalonia. No, 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 not Bavaria. Sorry, Baden-Württemberg, Ronalp, Ronalp in, in France uh, and Catalonia. Uh, you, you see how much time has passed since then. Um, so there are also forms of uh, transfrontier cooperation or territorial cooperation, uh, which are symbolic rather than um, pragmatic. In general, in the literature, uh, and also in some of the papers that uh, I realize you have already read, which is very helpful. Um, normally, the umbrella term that is used is cross-border cooperation or CBC, um, because this is something that is, you know, easier to to uh, to mention. It has kind of uh, uh, 
taken roots in, in the literature, although you find also all sorts of uh, different terminology. So cross-border cooperation is what is safer to use than uh, other concepts, uh, especially if you want to be general. Okay. Um, any point so far? Is that is that of any interest? I mean, this this conceptual framing. Okay, good. Um, now a little bit of uh, history. Um, I don't need to use much time for that because I mean it's also pretty intuitive. Um, yeah, let me see what I've done. Okay, yes. This slide basically tries to summarize um, what I'm going to say more in detail in the next ones. So uh, let's start with the situation of post-World War II, where activities that allowed people or uh, goods to cross the border or even to undertake some common activities were extremely rare and exceptional. Um, we had also an interesting example uh, in this area, um, which was the so-called accordino. There is no other terminology, neither in German but, uh, nor in, in English. Uh, it was part of the uh, Gruber de Gasperi agreement uh, for this region, uh, which had a sort of a, a appendix, appendix dealing with the economic uh, aspects. So it was uh, possible to uh, especially um, move people and goods from uh, Tyrol proper uh, to um, the uh, eastern part of Tyrol, which has no common border with Tyrol proper. As you know, Osttirol is, is not bordering Tyrol, but is part of the same land. So it's an exclave, uh, although in the same country. And so there were, you know, trains uh, back, I'm old enough to remember that the trains before Schengen, basically, uh, there were tra Austrian trains going from Lienz to Innsbruck and passing the whole of Pustatal and then and, and Sterzing and up to the Brenner, and they were not stopping because they were not allowed to stop. It was like the, the, the um, U-Bahn in, in Berlin, uh, the metro in Berlin, uh, where you know, it was going from uh, west to west via east and not stopping. Um, so just to also make a bit visible what it meant to have borders, proper borders. Now we live in a different, in a different world, but it is not long ago that it was a completely different situation. Now, um, together with the evolution of the European common project, let's say, um, the states also started to establish some very uh, loose legal rule uh, allowing their subnational entities to do something or at least not to prohibit them to enter into forms of cooperation with their neighbors. Um, the pioneer of that was, was Germany in particular uh, with the Lindau agreement. Lindau, uh, as you might know, is a, a lovely small city on the Lake Constance. And by chance, the lake shares the border with three countries, with Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So it's also natural that you know, areas that have some common issues want to, to be the forerun, the front runners of this sort of sort of, of agreements. So um, that, that was basically in 1957, the uh, Lindau agreement was the first um, international agreement. Um, between a group of countries, so Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and France, uh, to try to facilitate these activities. In most of the other experiences, things started to happen outside of the uh, legal framework. It was kind of a penumbra of the law, which was not prohibiting, but also not allowing things. And it was just, you know, things that were 
tolerated. Um, and, and then uh, if some sort of regulation was started, it was not uh, much public law implying authoritative uh, sovereign powers, but private law. So the uh, subnational authorities, regions, municipalities, etc., and even states started to uh, set up some sort of contracts, like private law contracts among themselves, making some form of exchange possible or, or easier. Um, there were also some big um, experiments of that kind including in this uh, area in the Alps, um, the uh, Arbeitsgemeinschaften that are, you know, um, organizations of private law uh, in the 70s, um, in, involving many areas uh, of different, uh, many regions of, of the Alpine area. Uh, Alpe Adria was, uh, for example, very relevant politically because it included Slovenia, for example, which was back then part of, you know, Yugoslavia and therefore on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Private law, it was nothing, nothing that could raise any trouble in terms of, uh, of uh, sovereign powers. But then this network became you know, more and more and more uh, present. And the Council of Europe started uh, in uh, 1990. Yeah. Yeah, but basically, oh, I wanted to mention this very nice sentence that this sort of gradual tolerance towards uh, cross-border activities has been effectively described as a process moving uh, or making some of the territories, the peripheral territories, the border areas of the states from peripheries of the empire to new centers in the periphery. The, the sentence uh, comes from Roberto Tonianti, who was sitting actually next door. Um, and uh, I, I find it very effective in terms of also making visible what happened. So these uh, areas ceased gradually to be very peripheral and became more and more central. Um, Yes, before the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, but certainly much more after that. Uh, in any case, so um, at some point at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, it became clear that all these activities could not be effectively carried out by private law only. Private law has its limits. You know, you can enter into contract, but then you can cannot really start sharing some powers uh, when these powers are public powers. Uh, you can organize a joint um, exhibition, for example. For that, you do not necessarily need public law. But if you want to establish a common transport uh, network, for example, or uh, have agreements uh, between different hospitals located in different parts of the border, then you necessarily also need public law. So um, it was the Council of Europe that um, tried to make sort of a qualitative leap um, out of this just basic uh, functionalism, just pragmatic solutions, and try to add some political vision. Um, the main document uh, was the Madrid Outline Convention uh, of the Council of Europe for the cooperation uh, of municipalities. Hmm? That was what was and still is the main common denominator in Europe. Uh, the European states have very different territorial set outs, but all have municipalities. And municipalities generally uh, enjoy a, quite a degree of, uh, of powers and therefore, the idea was to set up a minimum standard. There were also some standardized forms, for example, uh, for the countries of the Council of Europe. So basically all the countries within the European Union plus uh, other countries that were uh, about to join. Um, and then of course, after the 1989 
all former uh, countries, uh, countries of the former communist bloc. Uh, the idea was to establish a common standard, a common denominator, uh, the minimum of activities that were supposed to be not only tolerated, but also legally binding uh, for municipalities uh, belonging to countries of the Council of Europe. And that was extremely relevant. Uh, you should imagine uh, small municipalities uh, in border areas, really very small, that have no strong administrative capacities. They have very little stuff. So they, their creativity was also very limited. It was extremely helpful to have these standard forms uh, that they could simply um, adapt and 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 sign with the. Uh, neighboring municipality on the other side of the border. And that created a common legal basis to increase the activities that could be carried out uh, on a transfrontier basis. So much, much more. Um, plus in 19, 1985, uh, another treaty was established that also includes uh, a provision, only one, paragraph 10, uh, point three, forget it, but just uh, the lawyer needs to sometimes mention also the uh, paragraphs. Um, the European Charter for Local Self-Government uh, is to date uh, the most relevant um, international instrument for um, cooperation among, um, or, or for safeguarding, let's say, safeguarding uh, local and regional autonomy. Um, which is a very delicate matter, as you know, because this is considered to be something that belongs to the sovereign realm of the states, and therefore international uh, interference is not seen with uh, with great uh, pleasure by the states. But this is a common ground that uh, all the countries have agreed upon. Um, so the combination of the Madrid Outline Convention and the uh, European Charter for Local Self-Government, um, let's say, allowed these activities that were more or less existing to leave the legal shadow where they were confined and become something that was not only tolerated, but also legally promoted. The countries that signed these um, conventions, basically all the countries of the Council of Europe, now 46, because Russia has been expelled, um, allow for these basic uh, activities uh, that take place cross-border. Now, oh, mm, let's move on. Let's move on. Um, this convention uh, has been um, enriched by two additional protocols uh, in 1995 and 1998, respectively. Um, don't go into details of what has changed. And then uh, lately in 2009, by a third protocol, um, which has been adopted after the European Union has passed its important uh, legislation. Um, so this third protocol has made possible to create new bodies uh, of public international law. Uh, which are called Euro-Regional Cooperation Grouping. Uh, and that was the Council of Europe response to the European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation that had been established by the European Union just three years before. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, essentially, you don't find in Western Europe uh, any of these uh, uh, Euro-Regional Cooperation groupings, because of course uh, the European Union instrument is much more effective. Uh, but it is still relevant um, for borders of countries that do not border the European Union or countries that do border the European Union and establish this form between uh, their authorities and authorities of EU countries. So we have uh, some, including, for example, in uh, Switzerland. Um, the Council of Europe, since 2009, has 
lost much of the grip because of course the European Union has taken over. So for EU countries, the instruments of the Council of Europe are no more so relevant, uh, but indeed they are for other, for, uh, for non-EU countries. Plus the European, uh, the, the Council of Europe does a lot of interesting uh, academic work, monitoring work. Uh, I have mentioned here something, if you want to have a, a look, uh, including on this website, the Venice Commission, etc., cetera, um, on cross-border cooperation. But it is now, has been the, the, the pioneer and now it's just the authority that monitors how it works uh, under international law. But the big engine, has moved from Strasbourg to Brussels, yeah, from the Council of Europe to the European Union. Um, there was hardly anything at the EU level before 1989. Uh, since 1989, the European Union started to do its core business. What is the core business of European Union business? <laughs> so uh, to provide funds, this is what the Council of Europe does not have. And the most relevant program which exists still today uh, is Interreg. Uh, so again, regions, interregions, uh, the acronym. Uh, it's an initiative to enhance territorial cohesion, even before the establishment of a formal regional policy of the European Union, which was set up a bit later in time. Um, it was very, significant for the territories because they could benefit for the first time also uh, of some money coming from the European Union. Um, I guess you're familiar with the interreg programs. Um, also the universities now tend to uh, apply for some uh, funds. It's just funds to do programs, activities together that have an impact uh, on the practice, let's say. It's very broad. Um, in the 90s, uh, new instruments uh, were established at EU level, especially the um, European Economic Interest Grouping, a sort of a European law company, uh, which could be participated also by territorial um, authorities. So for example, the province of Trento could, and indeed did participate in one of that, to uh, promote the um, um, expo in uh, Hanover, I think it was, in uh, 2000. Uh, so it was not possible to do anything else. They created the three uh, provinces, uh, two provinces and the Land Tirol, um, which were no legal entity back then at, at, at all, but there was political will to do something together and to present themselves for the purpose of tourism or, or territorial marketing, et cetera, uh, at the World Exposition, they set up a European company, basically, uh, called European Economic Interest Grouping, uh, and they provided the money for that, and they could create uh, one um, yeah, private law, but still European private law company that could be beneficial to the promotion of cross-border activities, um, plus other uh, activities. But you know, the big turning point was in 2006, when a little bit out of the blue, honestly, it was there was no big preparation. Uh, the uh, European Commission prepared, and then the Parliament and the Council approved a regulation uh, that establishes the European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation, EGTC. This is a European Union public law body regulated by the law of the European Union. So irrespective of the law of the countries that of course integrated, but basically can exist only as an instrument of EU law created with a regulation, not even a directive, um, meaning the regulation is something that immediately enters into force and binds all the states and the citizens of the countries uh, with no need of um, ratification by the states. So it immediately entered into force and allowed to establish um, a, a sort of, yeah, 
public authority uh, of European law um, crossing the border. The sort of, of a European region, basically, um, with powers that the states decided to transfer to them. So the states were, of course, keeping a sort of last word of whether or not to allow the establishment of, of, of that authority. But it was a public law institution. That was, especially for this territory, a fantastic opportunity because they were kind of trying for decades to set up something that could not be set up with the existing legal instruments back then. Uh, and all of a sudden, it was possible to establish um, such uh, an authority. Uh, the Lisbon Treaty in 2009 uh, added some important provisions on uh, the territorial cohesion of the European Union, meaning that also additional funds can be uh, devoted to territorial cooperation. Um, and also it started a new, uh, very loose, a form of cooperation of a different kind among macro regions in Europe. So you see how many different levels you can have that cooperate among each other. Um, these are called the macro regional strategies. Uh, there is no legal framework for uh, the macro regional strategies, unlike for the uh, European groupings of territorial cooperation, but they are some sort of loose platforms where the territories, states, regions, municipalities belonging to macro areas in Europe come together and discuss issues of common interest. Uh, the first one was uh, the Baltic region, uh, then Danube, uh, Adriatic Ionic, and not, not the, the youngest one is the uh, macro regional strategy for the Alpine region. Um, they can, they have also started to allocate some funds to create some uh, platform. So very loose, but still something, a, a next stage of solidification of European law, uh, which uh, is going to take place in future. But, you know, the core remains this uh, EGTC, European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation. The regulation was amended in 2013, uh, making it easier to establish them and uh, also uh, allowing for uh, a more effective uh, governance. Um, there are some open issues. I don't think we should go into the legal details of, of that, but uh, the, the main problem is the judicial control over these authorities. Because of course, judicial authorities remain within the states. So you need to establish this EGTC uh, as a public law body of the European Union, but within the jurisdiction of one state. So there is a sort of an overlap. Uh, the European Court of Justice has never been really called to clarify some of the issues, including state liability. I don't want to go into the details, so, but the, the, the construction is complicated, but it exists anyway. Um, and this is something that is very, very relevant. Okay, uh, very short on the domestic side. So states have been benefiting a lot from the development of international, supranational European law, uh, because it has solved problems that states themselves were not able to solve, uh, not even when they wanted to cooperate with one another. Um, I make it short. I make it very short, and then I spend a couple of words on the case of Italy, which might be perhaps interesting, or, or you stop me and we can have this discussion. Um, essentially, okay, let's, let's move straight to Italy because this is a good example of, of what I'm saying here. Um, what the hell are um, cross-border activities, legally speaking? Um, essentially, uh, you know, many authors have used different uh, terms such as subnational foreign relations or paradiplomacy, etc. It's certainly not a subject matter itself, even though the Italian constitution, for example, says, well, whatever the regions can do internally, they can also do in the external projection. 
but it's not a, a competence by itself. It is a procedural framework. It is essentially something that allows the territories also to have an external dimension uh, when this is necessary or simply convenient to exercise the powers also outside of the strict border of the territory. Classical example, transport, for example. Now you can go with uh, uh, the same uh, ABO uh, from Trento to Innsbruck. Um, this is based on an agreement of that kind. So the territories have decided to join the administration of the ticket service. Um, they have done so. Uh, they have communicated to the state, look, we are going to do that. We are going to exercise our power uh, in transport issues uh, in a cross-border way. Uh, and we want to establish that. And the state essentially has the power to veto that if this and then is, this is where then the uh, jurisprudence, the case law comes in. Uh, the state or the government can deny that only if this um, affects the international relations of the country, the foreign policy of the country. Very slippery concept, of course. What is foreign policy? Um, Essentially, the government might argue that, you know, to cooperate with certain territories might be problematic from a foreign policy point of view. And it's clear that the regions cannot exercise foreign policy, but they can exercise their powers. So essentially is again, back to square one where we uh, have started the whole thing. So everything is tolerated until it is not prohibited. Um, and this is where we are essentially in most of the foreign activities based on domestic legislation. You can do whatever you want if you have provided you have the power, uh, if as long as the state does not veto it. But, and this is the Italian case, but uh, mutatis mutandis, is go, it goes also for uh, other countries, uh, the Constitutional Court in Italy has made very clear that it is only based on um, impact on foreign policy considerations that the, count the state can veto across border activities. If the government is not able to demonstrate that a regional activity, subnational activity, um, has a negative impact on its foreign policy, then this activity is in principle allowed, which is a sort of a Copernican revolution, as you can imagine, right? Of course, there is a huge margin of discretion in terms of you know, interpreting the uh, guidelines of foreign policy, uh, which is something that remains in the hand of the government because the regions cannot object. But um, in terms of construction of what is the rule and what is the exception, it is a very relevant step forward. So the regions can essentially do whatever does not um, limit or, or, or affect, negatively affect the foreign policy of the country. There have been, and there still are, some um, uh, arguments between regions and the, and the government, also depending on the political line of the regions of government, of course, the, the closer they are, the, the less problematic the relations are. Um, when it comes, for example, to um, economic activities, right? Uh, the state is very adamant or used to be very adamant in uh, preserving, um, that's the case of Italy, uh, the unity of the so-called economic foreign policy. They had the Instituto, what is it called? Instituto Italiano del Comercio Estero, so something like that. Uh, and they even, as you probably know, have tried to transform the embassies uh, into some sort of uh, um, uh, promotional uh, marketing uh, authorities to promote the, uh, the products of Italy, including of the regions. So there have been some, some issues, but all in all, it works. Um, and there is now even a practice of not necessarily telling the government everything. 
Um, it is a little bit of a gray zone. So uh, it's clear that you do not communicate, which would theoretically, legally still be uh, the case or, or uh, should it should be done uh, if a regional minister goes to some um, business trip in another country or region. Um, it should be communicated, but you know, as a matter of fact, it doesn't. It, it doesn't fly. It's simply not possible. So it is again the um, burden of proof, uh, which is with the national government to demonstrate that no, you should not have gone because we have a specific program uh, of economic cooperation with that country or with that region, uh, and therefore you you should have informed us. So it, th this gray zone is becoming bigger. Uh, due to the fact that the institutional aspect has been solved by means of the European groupings of territorial cooperation, and the fact that uh, the national legislation is more and more tolerant towards activities that in principle need to be communicated uh, and that the state has the power to veto, but then in practice, this is not really problematic. So you never know. You are a regional minister for whatever. You go to Münster and then you decide to establish a form of cooperation with your uh, partner in that region. Um, and then you come back home and you might find out that oh, it doesn't work. You should you should you should have communicating that to the government before and get the uh, authorization. But in practice, it doesn't it, it it doesn't work like this. It doesn't happen. So. Uh, things are becoming more and more natural. And as you know, a, a practice, a reiterated practice, is the very first source of law, customary law, <laughs> especially in the antiquity, but still today, is the first source of law that then, as a matter of you know, reiterating this practice, it solely fights, it becomes solid, and then it uh, is transferred into a proper legal norm. Um, okay, and this is happening in Italy, but also in other countries, um, below the level of the formal treaty making power. So the regions in Italy, in Germany, in Austria, in Belgium, in Spain, etc., have the power to conclude real international treaties. And in Italy, for example, it has never happened. In Austria, it has never happened. In Germany, very few. Um, in Spain, never happened. In Belgium, very few. So the classical international law instrument doesn't fit for the regions. It's much easier and better to move in this sort of gray zone um, of toleration of activities um, with the favor of the proof, uh, if, I, if, if it's clear what I mean. So you, you can do it, and it's the counterpart, is the national government that has to prove that that was not possible. Um, so it, it, is, it is establishing. And of course, this was all possible because um, the institutional framework um, is facilitated a lot by the um, European Union instruments. Okay, um, yeah, I think we have to stop. Um, what to do? <laughs> what to do? <laughs> Shall I try to respond to the questions? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, then let me stop and then maybe, yeah, uh, maybe I can make some reference uh, to something I mentioned here uh, while discussing. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this very enlightening, of course, here it is. And uh, so we save. Okay, <laughs> very enlightening and rich uh, talk. Uh, uh, I open the floor for debate um, to those connected online. 
um, I think you can ask your question simply by raising your hand or alternatively, you have to write your question, but not in the chat, if I am right, yes, but in a specific section, which is called, I don't know how, Domande risposte. So there you can write your questions and then I will see them here and read them. And for those who are here, you are invited to ask questions, both the students and the PhD students. There are no stupid questions. So please. Maybe I can ask my first question in the meantime. Um, uh, it, is, it was very, very interesting. I took a lot, I took a lot, a lot of notes. Um, a very important and difficult issue for us is, as you already noticed in Bolzano at our meeting, terminology. So we have the problem of choosing, for example, between border or frontier, also because we do not have only one word in Greek. So we cannot say, okay, we simply take the Greek word and that's it. We need to use modern terminology, which makes everything more difficult. And we still have to, to, to deepen this question. And uh, so I, I, I'm asking you to elaborate more on this. Why is frontier better than border or the other way around? What would you suggest? What's the difference? Uh, I guess there is also a difference depending on US English and UK English uh, or on the tradition of different countries. Yep. Thank you. If you can elaborate on this. Only to a limited extent, because I mean, terminology is extremely complicated. And as I said, the reason for establishing a different terminology is also a very trivial one. Um, but in general, um, I would I would call it cross-border. Cross-border is simply because this is the most established term in, uh, in literature. So um, from an academic point of view, I think it's the safest way. Um, I see the point of the European Union in speaking of territorial cooperation, also because territories are, can be of different kind and, and nature. And then you start a debate with Germans saying, oh, the land are states, and or no, they're not states. Um, oh, let's call them regions and let's call them uh, comunidades autonomas. So the, the states have very different terminologies themselves. So territory is the most neutral uh, term that you can use. But territorial cooperation um, does not address the border issue necessarily. Um, so it is kind of implicit. Again, within the European Union, it makes sense because, you know, it's the same union and all the territories uh, ex are European territories irrespective uh, of the country they uh, are located in. But yeah, I, I, I would say perhaps to, to be safe, just use cross-border or, or territorial when you, you know, uh, do not necessarily have to imply the border, but in, in your case, the border is quite relevant. And uh, you would not use frontier? Mm -hmm. Less. Okay. I mean, the Council of Europe does it, so yeah. it's, it's, it's okay to uh -huh. use it, but um, I, I think um, it's just a pragmatic uh, solution. I don't have a enlightening uh, theoretical explanation for that it's just more established maybe yeah. thank you other questions or comments or Um, do you believe that uh, this uh, decentralized uh, model of interaction between regions could be a little more problematic for uh, fragile countries uh, in terms of uh, um, economics and politics?
Well, in, in, indeed, <laughs> this is an issue. Um, that's essentially the main dilemma of uh, international relations overall. Um, international law presumes that all the countries are the same. And then you have the US and uh, Malawi, and it's quite difficult to consider them to be equal, even though they have the uh, sovereign equality, as it's called in international law. Um, and the same can happen also with regions. Um, and this is one of the arguments that is used by the um, critics uh, or, or those who are very against uh, cross-border cooperation because, and they have some point in that, you tend to cooperate with those that are kind of considered to be upper in the hierarchy, in the social, economic, cultural hierarchy, um, which in some case can be seen as a sort of a first uh, stepping stone towards a possible secession. You prefer to be with them rather than, than with other regions of your country, uh, especially, and we come back to that, uh, if there is also an ethno-linguistic uh, uh, element uh, in, in that. So yes, it can be uh, the case. At the same time, it can also work differently. So um, you, if it, if a Ur territory um, cooperates strongly with a territory that has better infrastructures or, or stronger economics, it can benefit from it. So um, why not? Why not? Of course, it's extremely delicate because then, you know, if you cooperate, I mean, you can, you can see both um, corners of, of, the, of the dilemma. Uh, but in, in principle, both options can be true, but you should look at the cooperation as, as an instrument, not as what can be the consequence. So a, a knife can be uh, very useful to cut uh, the meat, uh, but also to kill somebody. But it's not the reason for prohibiting it, uh, you know, ex ante. Of course, it can be also used in a problematic way. Uh, that's for sure. And it can also have some um, destabilizing impact. Yeah, that's that's clear. I, I hope I have kind of answered. And then, of course, if you start cooperating with a country that uh, starts distributing passports to the uh, uh, people living in that in that country, I mean, like uh, Ru Russia has been doing that uh, since two thousand um, systematically, and then uh, like in Ossetia, Abkhazia, Donbas, uh, and other territories, and then you know you have your citizens there, and then you have the right to protect them. So it can become extreme but even in in territories uh, where the the borders are much less problematic you remember the issue in south tyrol with the double passport oh well then then you know uh, this is not necessarily uh, linked to um to cross border cooperation uh, then you need to have the state jumping in because subnational uh, authorities cannot provide citizenship uh, but it is it i mean the the problem is there but that doesn't mean that uh, if it can be dangerous then you don't use it yeah thank you there is a question online by jeremy mckinney um, a classicist scholar expert in federalism ethnicity and many other issues thank you jeremy for following us i try to to read your question uh, could you comment on asymmetrical border phenomena uh, as for example the movement of roma people across national borders Not sure I got the question. Whether what is what is the where is the asymmetry here? Um, 
Maybe. I can comment on the Roma issue, which is okay. extremely interesting, but I'm not sure that this is what colleague wants. Maybe, Jeremy, can you ask your question live so we can get uh, what you mean by asymmetrical border phenomena? Sure. Can you hear me Hi. clearly? Yes, we hear you. Hi. 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 Uh, thank you very much for the talk, uh, Francesca. That was marvelous. Uh, but what I meant by asymmetrical was that uh, we've been talking about things like states and regions and localities, all of which have a kind of fixed territoriality. But uh, many... ...to locality. And um, I was wondering if you could just comment on how that, that intersects with or how that fits with the kind of model of uh, legal procedures that you've been talking about. I'm afraid we have lost part of the question. Oh, Do, can you hear me now? The connection, yeah, yeah. But we... uh, I, I'm very sorry. Let me try this one more time. And if this doesn't... Sorry. It's, the, con it's the connection. Sorry. sorry, Jeremy, if you can ask your question again. Yes, I'll, I'll try again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, here we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for the talk. I, I just wanted to ask how the the legal systems that you're talking about which are generated by states by localities and by regions how these are experienced by and how they interact with people whose connection to borders um, are fundamentally different from those of us who live in nations and regions and states people like the roma who move between these um, does the, the system of law that you're speaking about have a way of dealing with people who are fundamentally um, differently located in territory? Thank you. Oh, that's very, very, very interesting. In fact, I, I would say the um, super simplified answer is no. Uh, but the more nuanced answer is that territories are normally uh, concerned with the exercise of powers that they can that they already have, which normally do not affect the protection of fundamental rights of people. So minority rights in general are not part of the domain of subnational uh, authorities at least to some to some uh, degree um when it comes to roma in particular um, by, by the way uh, roma are no longer moving as a matter of fact because there is no <laughs> way to move well even though it is part of the tradition uh but it, it's not really happening anymore but the problem uh was that um the european union has tried to kind of approach this problem that you have mentioned um, in the early 2000s, um, trying to or proposing to uh, divorce the European Union citizenship from the citizenship of the member states. Uh, and that with special regard to uh, the Roma. The Roma. Um, there are many uh, stateless Roma um, or Roma that move or try to move from one country to the other. Well, back then it was an issue, of course, many people from the Balkans uh, uh, leaving their uh, home countries and then settling in uh, Western European countries. So uh, the idea was to, uh, again, create a European Union instrument that could then force the states to take care of people that were uh, not, let's say, at the core of their attention, to put it diplomatically, uh, and having them as citizens of the European Union, then it entitled them also of certain rights. Um, but this has net, never happened, that has not materialized, guess why, of course, um, and, uh, and therefore, um, I'm afraid this is too progressive and sophisticated of a, of a thought to um be politically viable uh in in the in the subnational territories so normally it the cross border activities tend to be something that is is more it's easier to sell can i say that 
Uh, so with uh, the rights of the marginalized people, you don't get, get votes. And if you establish uh, something that is visible or a nice infrastructure or what have you, then it's much more popular in a way. And this is also something that plays a role. Not sure I, I gave you a real answer, I'm afraid, but that was really like conceptually a very, very interesting subject. Oh, hey. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. You're too, is... you're too kind, but thank you. <laughs> there is a question here in the room by Marco Ferrario, our PhD student. Thank you. Thank you on my side as well for the for the very nice talk. I have two questions. Uh, one is somehow, I hope, related to, to, to Professor McKinnon's. Uh, um, how is the Baltic macro region doing? Because, I mean, um, that's that's not, as far as I understand, it's not one case uh, like uh, Ossetia or Abkhazia, where the Russians have been delivering passports as candies. Uh, but the problem comes on the other on the other side, uh, in a way. I'm thinking especially of of Estonia, in Narva, for example. I mean, they have every interest, and they are forced, in a way, to cooperate uh, with 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 a foreign country. Especially because they have part of their own population, which is and it isn't uh, Estonian or Latvian. I, I just read now that the Latvians are now passing very restrictive rules uh, on Russians living there for decades. And and how is how is this affecting? I mean, even even taking the war the war aside, and the same goes with Finland. I mean, I imagine that now with the NATO entry, many things that were were changing, but they have had every interest. Uh, where they just for the booze uh, to, to to get all sorts of Russians uh, to to there without uh, visa. And so how is how is that region doing? That's the first question. Um, and the second one, what you were mentioning, kind of uh, at some point in the talk, a minimum baseline uh, that was agreed upon, uh, uh, also at the level of let's say territoriality, you know, municipalities, if I understood correctly, as the minimum baseline. Uh, I mean, I understand that this is also possibly due to historical reasons. So what the municipality might have been since the Middle Ages, the, the, the minimum baseline in a way. Uh, but are we sure it's always the most viable instrument and hasn't, hasn't been thought of something even lower and more flexible? I, I say this because uh, I, I'm dealing with Central Asia, which is a completely different context i understand but i happen to read a study on co cooperative cross border cooperations between afghanistan and uzbekistan and the more the state the two states paradoxically tried to cooperate to prevent drug dealing smuggling and whatever the less effective it was because the society on the ground works on different principles and so how how does this European regulation, if it does, uh, somehow cope to really micro level specificities. Uh, thank you. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, the the um, Baltic region is doing uh, well with if you if you take the perspective of the uh, macro regional strategy of the European Union, they are even you know, more and more pushed to cooperate with one another, with one another. Uh, and of course, it affects the European Union uh, and not the, the outside border. So this is an intra-European cooperation. Um, as you said, the baseline, the baseline needs to be there uh, also in terms of uh, goodwill, and in terms of you know having some common ground. And as you know, in the Baltic countries, from the 90s onwards, there was no common will. Uh, initially, essentially, uh, by the uh, new dominant nations. Uh, and uh, afterwards, uh, uh, of course, especially after the, um, 
how can I say, the uh, autocratic uh, involution of Russia, then of course on the other side. Well, Estonia, as you know, that does not only share the region of Narva uh, with some many economic, cultural and central activities with Russia. They also share a, a common lake, which was by the way, an interesting factor of cross-border cooperation in the 90s, even in uh, times when the situation or the, the relations with Russia was pretty tense, but still it worked. And nowadays, to my information, everything has stopped and even the lake is militarized. And, you know, so if there is no common ground, I mean, then you cannot really cooperate and you cannot compare apples with uh, with, with uh, oranges, right? Um, and uh, and so when it comes to the second point, um, he, well, the municipality is the uh, minimum common denominator. There have been attempts to uh, move a step forward and also establish, for example, a charter for regional uh, autonomy, but that's that does not being welcomed by the states for obvious reasons. Because then uh, when it, as long as it is about administrative uh, authorities, administrative power, not political entities, well, you can control them better. Uh, when it comes to political autonomy, um, everything becomes a little bit more uh, dangerous and it's the states that normally break on this uh, on these developments. There is the willingness, especially not only by the subnational entities, but uh, uh, even more by um, by the international um, the international uh, organizations to uh, improve on that but the states kind of break a lot uh, on that sort of developments. So we remain uh, at the level of the minimum common denominator, which is good enough. I mean, then the states can uh, decide to, to uh, go a little beyond that. Um, we have interesting examples of cross-border cooperation activities that involve only uh, subnational authorities with political power, like in this region or between Veneto, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, Kärnten. So it, it, it is uh, growing, but certainly not as, as far as to constitute a new minimum denominator. The minimum denominator remains the local authorities. Sorry, just a very quick follow-up question. What are they doing with Kaliningrad? Accordino. <laughs> Slightly Accordino. So the, the trains still go from Kaliningrad to Russia, but they are completely sealed and non-stop. And, yeah. and I guess it will be the same for quite some time, I'm afraid. Yeah. But this is, I, I, I don't think this is part of the uh, macro-regional strategy. It's probably just how to deal with a exclave and yeah. thank you any more questions here or online well in fact it is very late <laughs> well, the next time you tell us something about central asia and the informal cross border cooperation there well i can also tell you a couple of stories of my experience there um yeah, it, it's a completely different um, procedural and cultural setting, um, which does not mean that it's necessarily less effective. Um, it, it, it Maybe it's too effective sometimes. Uh, and, but this is why um, a legal, a certain degree of legal regulation is necessary. Otherwise, it's just like, you know, factual things. Uh, and there is no distinction between positive and negative ones. So it's like positive cross-border cooperation and smuggling is exactly the same then in the end, it can become. So thank you very much to our speaker, Professor Francesco Palermo and to those here in the room and to those connected online. I'm. Also delighted to invite you to our next webinar, which will be on Tuesday, uh, May 23rd. Professor Peter Funke,
from Münster will speak on own and common reflection on internal borders of ancient Greek federal states. Thank you again.